The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. So, kamma or karma, what does it mean? Everybody always used this word, kamma. Oh, it's my kamma. I got sick, it's my kamma. Is that true? Is that your kamma? Oh, you know, somebody got hit by the car, it's their kamma. There was a tsunami in Sri Lanka and a lot of people died in one village. It was their kamma. That's their karma, was it? Is it? Are we using the term correctly, what, how the Buddha meant, meant it to be? The kamma. Uh, if you get sick, is it your kamma? What do you think? Cause and condition, cause and effect. So everything is cause and effect. That's what the Buddha thought, right? It's cause and condition. So obviously you would think, whatever you put a cause, you know, the condition, the cause would come out, right? The Buddha did teach that way. So everything would be karma then, right? No. The Buddha never thought that, unfortunately. There's a bit of a misunderstanding, unfortunately, and it's been... Especially, I've heard in the Mahayana tradition, there's a quite a strong um, idea that everything is karma. And there's, there's, oh, karma, they say more like karma. That's the Sanskrit word. But the Buddha, unfortunately, did not teach that. So you are using the words wrongly, and I will prove that. So I was, I was thinking about this a little bit. And why I came to this being, because somebody asked me some time ago that, that there's sometimes you hear this, that there is uh, different things which, call, which are, you know, which causes karma or which are not karma. And I looked into the, like, oh yeah, wh where is it in the suttas? And it's in the Samyutta Nikaya. And this is from Bande Suttado's translation. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling in Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel sanctuary. And then the wanderer, Mola, Moli, Molia Sivaka, approached the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with them. When they had concluded their greetings and cordial talk, he sat down to one side and said to the Blessed One. So that was just the normal way the suttas always start. Master Gautama, there are some ascetics and Brahmins who hold such a doctrine and view that as this. Whatever person experiences, whether it's pleasant or painful, neither painful nor pleasant, all that is caused by what is done in the past. What does Master Gautama say about this? Right? So, whatever person experiences is caused by what was done in the past. So, everything is cause and conditions. So, that's what they, they, these... Uh, uh, that there are some ascetics and Brahmins who hold this view. Hmm? Okay, that sounds like a lot of people, what Buddhists believe as well, right? I've heard this so many times. Okay, let's see what Buddha says. Some feelings, Sivaka, arise from here, arise here, originating from bile disorders. That some feeling arise here, originating from bile di disorders, one can know for oneself, and that is considered to be true in the world. Now when those ascetics and Brahmins now when those ascetics and Brahmins hold such a doctrine and view as this, whatever person experiences, whether it's pleasant or painful or neither pleasant or neither painful nor pleasant, just sort of feeling you don't even feel, all this all that is caused by what is done in the past. They overshoot what one knows by oneself, and they overshoot what is considered to be true in the world. Therefore, I say that this is a wrong on the part of those ascetics and Brahmins. So all the disease, so we have the pile, bile disorders, it's just a name for a disease. If I go to the doctor these days, I don't, so, I don't say I have a bile disorder, but if you went in ancient India, maybe even these days you say, oh, I have a bile disorder, or the doctor comes, that's how they diagnosed you. So if that, those, those Brahmins and ascetics, if they come and say, you know, that's my past 
that comes from my past, they overshoot what one knows be one's by oneself and they overshoot what is overshoot what is considered to be true in the world. So that's not the Buddha always thought which is true in the world. And that's the Dhamma. Dhamma is to be it's true in the world. We in Buddhism we don't try to bend our faith to match the world. We if something doesn't match, then that cannot be Dhamma. Dhamma it's always matches with the world. Okay, so the, it's a quite a short sutta, but let's go a little bit. Some feelings, Sivaka, arise here originating from phlegm disorders, originating from wind disorders, originating from imbalance of the three, produced by the change of climate, produced by the careless bef- behavior caused by assault, produced as a result of kamma. That some feeling arise here, product as the result of kamma, one can know for oneself. That is, and that is considered to be true in the world. Now, when those ascetics and brahmins hold such a doctrine and, and view as this, whatever a person experiences, whether, it's, whether it be pleasant or pain or painful, or neither pleasant nor painful, all that is caused by what was done in the past, they overshoot what one knows by oneself, and they overshoot what is considered to be true in the world. Therefore, I say that this is wrong of the part of those ascetics and brahmins. Okay. When this was said, the wonder Mola S- Molia Sivaka said to the Blessed One, Magnificent Master Gautama, Sadhu, that's the Sadhu, Magnificent. Magnific- magnificent Master Gautama. From today, let the Master Gautama remember me as a lay fellow who has gone for refuge for, lives, for life. And then he gives this like law. Um, uh, poem here at the end where he recites this pile, phlegm and also wind, imbalance and climate too, carelessness and assault with kamma as the eight, kamma results as the eight so okay let's take these things so bile, phlegm and wind those are the three kinds of diseases so usually they said, you know, it's the, the Buddha said, you know, like quite often somebody comes to you and he said, you know, how are you? And he said, no, the winds are just so strong in my body. That's how they call the diseases, the phlegm disorders uh, and the imbalance in your body. We don't, we don't talk about uh, diseases that, that way anymore. And this is interesting, produced by the chains of climate. So that would be the next one. So that's nothing to do with you. You know, it gets in the winter, you might get sick. It gets in the winter and maybe you feel down because you don't get so sun, so much sun. Is it your kamma? No, it's just nature. Produced by the careless behavior. If you accidentally step on a stake, let me tell you a story. During the last vasa, I was in Porinyana. We have this thing with Ajahn Pramali and I, we go for walks. Ajahn Pramali is my good friend in Porinyana. We, you, you, as a, when, when it's during the Vasa, you, you just sit all day and you just get bit, you know, your mind gets a bit muddled because you don't have that much energy. So once in a while we go for the walks and we try to, you know, walk at a brisk pace and we, we try to limit our talking too much and we talk about Dhamma. And somebody will like, if a lot of you know Ajahn Pramali, it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. Imagine for me, I can just go for walks many times a week with a bright teacher like Ajahn Pramali. We were walking, we, this Bodhinyana in Perth, it's on the steep hills, and there's this gorgeous and the steep hills. And I was, we went down from Ajahn Pramali's Kuti and we, you know, into this gorge, and we start walking up this really, really steep hill. And there was this stake really was a long stake and we were r- almost running Ajahn Pramali he used to be a, like a sports person so he was, he was still he's had these massive legs and I'm in like I have like really short legs so I'm like a little mice hobbling along with this giraffe with Ajahn Pramali he's just running ahead of me and he was just walking and I was just trying to like bouncing from rock to rock like wee, 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 behind and I stepped on this stake on this steep hill and he went through my sandal like a butter and through through the sandal in the bottom of my foot and it really like embedded it was 
what, what happened, the neighbor's farmer, we have what they call the star pickets, they had taken the star picket and obviously it was really deeply in the ground and they just wiggled it off so the iron had broken. Star picket has those three ends and the one end was just cut into this like really like a dagger. So it was really long but very narrow but it just went into my leg. So we were hour and a half away from the monastery. As monks we don't have mobiles. I carry now the Newbury Monastery mobile because so, I'm working there so much. But so we were really far away in this like middle of nowhere. And we had to walk back. What, there's nothing else we could do. But was that my karma that I stepped on that stake? Did I call some, maybe I stepped on the center bead when I was in my past life. And I, I was full of anger because the center bead, you know, like it, it, it strike you, you know, they're very painful, especially in Asia, those big center bees. And I was so angry maybe in a past life and I stepped on it, I killed it. And because of that, I'm now this lifetime I stepped on a stake? No, it doesn't work that way. It was carelessness. I mean, it wasn't really, it was almost like accident, but you can say that carelessness and accidents and those things, it's the same category. It's not your kamma. You're overshooting. Oh, I got an accident, that was my kamma. Ah, you're overshooting what you know, right? You're going too far with the kamma. Okay, so that was the story. and. I managed, oh, Ajahn, I was so good. The best thing about this, Ajahn Pramali was really impressed because I, I hobbled all the way to monastery, hour and a half, with my, I just kept pleading and pleading and pleading. And I think the good thing was like, it cleaned that wound. So we went to the uh, doctors afterwards, they cleaned it, they gave me a, a shot, and I was fine. It took me quite a while to get healed because it went into my foot, but anyways. All right, so carelessness, it's not your karma. Assault is not your karma. How can the Buddha say that? If somebody assaults you, they rob you, they um, just come and and somehow assault you out of out of nowhere. The Buddha said it's not your karma, because you overshoot what you know. You don't know from the past that that's caused, but you are adding stories. Maybe it is that person's karma to assault you. He did not pull himself, self, himself back from the anger, from the greed. He wanted to rob you. He is creating karma. But is it your karma to get assaulted? Somewhere in the street? No. That's what the Buddha is saying. Can you see? Most of the things are not your karma. Da da da. That's what the Buddha is saying. Kama is the result as the eighth. Okay. So, uh, I tell another story. I was in, uh, I was in India. This, uh, I, lived, uh, I stayed in a monastery in India. It's a, very, it's a quite a nice monastery. It's, um, there's a lot of little children and they, were, they are, uh, come from very poor families and they their family have to put them in a monastery and they, they stay there and they get you educated there. And I stayed in this monastery in India. <clears throat> they're about 80 children. And there's this uh, Swiss group came there and they're supporting this monastery and there's also a nearby orphanage where they got, get through this. So it's a beautiful thing to do if you ever, you know, consider doing something good, support orphanages and, you know, good organizations. They are out there. So they, they or, in this Swiss group, they're very organized. They got this thing going. And we went on this bus, bus tour. We went for the monastery, went to the orphanage a bit further away. And then I started to talk to this uh, quite a young Swiss lady. And while we're talking about, you know, all the normal questions, why did I become a monk? What, what is Buddhism and all that? They, they support these orphanages. And it's the, the founder is a Buddhist. And she's a very nice, she's supported me many years as well. But a lot of the rest of them, they meditate. They don't really consider themselves Buddhist. But so she was still interested. And we were talking about this kamma. And then she told me this story. She was quite a distraught about this. And she said that what happened, she went to 
uh, just wanted to have a good time with her friend. It wasn't her boyfriend, it was a, but it was a male friend and they, just somebody she knew from the school, I think. And they, you know, what should they do? So they went into a bar. That's what you do, you know, you just go and have a, you know, in this bar and it was, maybe it was more like a nightclub, I think it was. So, and what happened, they were, she was there and for some reason, there were a group of four guys and they started to pick on his, on, on her friend. They just started to, you know, abuse him and just like what they were, they were just drinking there on a bar and they were just like getting rowdy and they were just pushing him a little bit and stealing his drinks or whatever happened. And he just, you know, he just took the abuse and he was just like not retaliating and, you know, they was just moving along. But for some reason, this, especially this one guy, he just kept following, well, following him. And then they said, okay, well, you know, that's it. You know, it's, it's not really fun. Let's just go home. So they, they went, and by that time, the, the, the group of four guys, they just happened to be outside having a cigarette there because you cannot smoke inside. And the one guy, he started get, coming again and just like pushing him. And, you know, they were obviously quite drunk. And they were just pushing this, this lady's friend. And, you know, and he just got really fed up, and he just pushed him away. And this guy was, he's just straddled backwards. He took a few steps, and he hid his heel in the sidewalk and he went head first onto the you know into the curb and what happened that guy got quadriplegic so he was paralyzed from neck down so she 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 was crying and she said what we did what did we do wrong they were bullying us he was just out of just you know wanting to get rid of that other fellow who was bullying him just pushed him away and out of just that accident, he became, you know, uh, paralyzed from neck down. And obviously they had to go to court if, you know, something like that happens and everybody was interviewed. I think there was a, you know, he, he, he had to end up getting, no, I don't think he, I don't remember whether he even had to pay a fine for that. But, so she was distraught and, you know, and for me, I thought about it and what can he really say? It's, it's not your fault. Well, it's not really your karma again. It's it's a, it's an assault. It's carelessness. Did you, did he produce a lot of bad karma for making somebody quadriplegic? Maybe not. What caused that thing to happen? Why don't we drink in Buddhist? Why do we take the precepts of not going into certain places and not drink? So, especially for us monks, we shouldn't even go out at night time. We sh we shouldn't hang out in certain places. Why? Because they're dangerous. So what, when they decided, every step they, on the way, when they were going in the bar, let's, they were just wanted to have some good time, but everything they do to go towards that direction causes its kamma. Everything you willfully made, you are going to the bar, you're gonna drink, Every step in the way, you cause karma. Every lo every one of those little steps. So if somewhere you would have said, let's just go for you know a cup of coffee and walk walk in a park and like let's you know watch TV in indoors or go and talk to other friends, go on the meditation club somewhere you know safe. It would not happen. You give the karma opportunity to rise. If you start hanging out in the bars a lot, you give the karma opportunity to ripen. If you hang out in the monastery like I do, I don't really give that karma too much opportunity to ripen to somebody assault me in the bar. It might still happen. Maybe there's a karma, I go pin the butt early in the morning, somebody just stumbles out of the bar and smashes into me because it, I, who knows? But I don't give the opportunity to come and to ripen in that sense. There is nothing inherently bad about going to bars, obviously. But you, every time you do that, you give opportunity to ripen. So I, I asked. I this was the sutta. So I, I, I figured out it's like, oh, that must be the sutta. And so then I asked my dear. Teacher Ajahn Permali about this 
uh, I said this Ajahn Pramali, is this is this the sutta what you know like what what explains uh, the kamma and Ajahn Pramali says that yes that's like to be the sutta uh, y you are looking for in this fa in fact this particular classification of eight causes so there's eight causes for kamma for feeling is found in several places and suttas and I cannot see any reason to think that it's not an original. The list se may seem a bit weird, but it's mostly because they use an ancient Indian idea especially about illnesses. The disor disorders originating from pile, phlegm and wind are simply names for illnesses. Which is very interesting because it means that illnesses generally are not due to kamma. If you get sick, not your kamma. Or if you look at, at some of the other factors, such, such as unsolved or careless behavior, it is obvious that a lot of what we experience has nothing to do with karma. <laughs> da, da, da. Being careless and relying on your karma to help you out is not the way, not good to help you out, meaning getting out of the samsara, is not the way to go. It's not that you create this a lot of big idea that you just get a lot of big punya, right? I've heard a lot of Sri Lankans say that. I know in Thai traditions, definitely. All, and a lot of monks always, you know, if you hear Thai monks give a speech, and I don't speak, you know, I, I, I can pick up, you know, Thai here and there because I've been around that, you know, in nine years now and being a Thai ladies and Thai monks. And, and they always, you know, like, they always say this word comes out when they start giving uh, Dhamma talk, punya, punya. Thai monks give talks like that all the time. Create good punya, this kind of something goodness from you, and that takes you to a good place. It's a big dangerous thing to you know teach. Obviously, they're trying to up uplift your mind, but if you're just trying to like make a mon get a money in your bank account, and you somehow that grades your good karma, and that good karma will take you out. No. Samsara is what it is. You still experience pain and misery, like the rest of us. So what did Dajan Pramali write? Um, so none it, none it, it's nothing to do with karma. Karma is mostly about where we get reborn. But once, you, once you're there, it's mostly about ac accepting the difficulties in life, of life. I like that. It's mostly where you get reborn. It's mostly about, you get reborn where? In a human plane. Why? Because we know how to get born as a human. It's just our habit. That's a really, really strong habit we have. The Buddha had a simile about to get a re human rebirth, it's like a turtle swimming in the sea, and you know, and he pokes his head out once in a hundred years or something it was, and if he pokes the head out of the you know the ocean, it's the, the it's like the it's putting through the head th through a yoke, you know what they yoke the horses. So you would like to see the turtle swimming there, and it's just out of ocean. It just pokes its heads and it's like puts the head through the yoke. That's the the, there was a, there's a simile like that, and sometimes people say that, oh, well, that means that it's really, really out of nowhere that we get this opportunity to get born as a human being. That, it's again, it's taking out of the context. What does that mean? It means that if you are some other plane, let's say you're an animal, let's say you're peta, you or you're in a deva locus, for you to get born as a human, it's a really strange happening. It's really good luck to get born as a human. But once you are human, you get born as a human. That's how it is, because we're used to it. You don't get born as a fish. Maybe if you swim a lot, all the time. I don't know, maybe not, <laughs> even then. But mostly we get born as a human. Uh, mostly we get born in the situation you feel comfortable to. You get born as a Sri Lankan. 
you get born, I got born as a Finn. But something in me got me interested in, in, in the Dhamma, and something in me, once I heard I could be a monk, I wanted to go for it. There was something in my Kamma. But most likely, you won't get born as a Kenyan, because you don't have any contact with them. Maybe if you spend a lot of time in Australia, you most likely would get born as an Aussie. But what happens, most of the time we get born into the same families. Because your family, you have a strong attachment to your family. And I can feel that attachment. Maybe you don't even notice that because if you're with your family all the time, you don't see that attachment. But for me, I see my family maybe once a year. This year I went there and I saw my family maybe a week and a half. A whole year I see my family, a week and a half. And I can see the connection. It's very easy for me to be around my mother. As is as if I never left. I can just be with my mother and it's easy. She knows what to cook, what I like. She treats me a certain way of this like you treat your children. And it's very comforting for me to be around her. And same for my father. We can just be in silence. We don't have to talk about things. We don't have to introduce ourselves because we know each other. We know the family. It's so easy to get born in the same family because that's your condition. Same thing for, for you or for me rather. I remember I was teaching, we, we conducted this retreat. I go, I try to help the Buddhist community in Finland as well. I'm the only Theravada monk from Finland, so I'm a rare species, you have to take care of me. I'm, I might go distinct if you don't take care of me. And so we, we did, we, I conducted this retreat, we went to this walk. It was a, it's a beautiful time of the year because it's springtime. Now it's midsummer, but it was springtime a month ago. And we went to this island, and it's a beautiful island just outside of Helsinki, the capital. And we took a boat there, and it's this just old villas, old sort of, it's really anything, nothing was built there after 50s. And the only way that they, they get this boat, so what we did, we took this, what we call the nature walks. And we, we went there and we set up the rules, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna walk in silence. There was this, the, the group leader who's been there before, he said, you know, you're gonna lead and we're just gonna walk silently, walk through the nature and just observe and then afterwards we can do the talking and wrapping up and we you know we walked into places and meditated a little while for one place looking into the ocean it's just absolutely beautiful there looking into the oceans there in springtime everything is green and there's this the, it's flourishing clean not, not like here in australia everything is quite dark green over there everything is so bright and i can smell everything it reminds me of my childhood all the spring smells are coming because i grew up there reminds me when you smell something you don't have to think about oh i remember that. it's just the smell you associate that straight away with something it's like the fresh cut you know grass or you you know cooking what do you you know you remember some and you just you know where you remember that smell certain things like i i always spend summers with my grandmother's place in a really remote part of finland and, you know, she had a horse and sheep and, you know, three or four cows and all that. So it was a very farm. So I know the smell of grass when it starts coming in the, in the springtime. And that, and, the, you know, the trees, I know the names of the trees. I know the birds which are singing that time of the year. Because I grew up in that nature. And I could feel the, the craving coming to me. Oh, this is so nice. I get, I... I really, I hold on to that idea. It's so easy to hold into the idea of childhood memories. It's so difficult to let them just, you know, you let them go. And I can see, I, we had this, you know, meeting afterwards and they said, okay, let's talk about what you experienced. And everybody was saying how beautiful, quiet it is and it's so nice to walk in the nature and you see so much more. And I said, oh, I suffered so much. I can see myself why I got born there, because I feel so comfortable there. I know that place. And I said, you know, and I was trying to explain, and the, the only the leader, he said, oh, 
now, now is the first time I understood what you mean by that. You get born in a certain place. Rest of them, they, they were, the rest of the group was sort of just like, oh, they thought I was a bit of a downer, that I was just putting down this beautiful experience. But I said, oh, I really, really suffered because it was so beautiful, and I wasn't just letting the beauty be there. I was making stories about it. It's mine. This is my country. This is where I belong. So, see, we get born to certain places. It's easy for us because we recognize that. You recognize your family, you feel comfortable. You recognize the culture you come from, maybe. But most, at least you recognize that you're a human being. You get born as a human. What's given? Happiness is given. But the flip side of happiness is suffering. That's your karma. You get born as a human. Sure, it is your karma. But mostly the rest of the stuff, not your karma. What is it? Nature. Nature will take care of it. And you get sick. You get old age. It's given. Nothing can stop that. And it's not your karma. It's just because you, oh, you didn't read the fine print. Oh, I get born as a human? Oh, I get sick. Well, I don't really think, I don't know if I want that. I get old? I think I should take the Deva Loka next time. <laughs> what do you expect? That's what you, when you get born here. Very good. So I, I was thinking about it a little bit more, but uh, about the Kamma. And, and there's... Uh, so what causes good karma then? And the Buddha did teach good karma. And there is a sutta, the law of karma. Why beings fare as they do after, after death. And that's a, it's a bit longer sutta, but there is a, uh, again, somebody goes and talks to Buddha. And, you know, he says, you know, you are the Buddha, you know, could you tell me about the uh, what is the cause and conditions why some beings are here but some beings here on the break up of the body after death are reborn in a state of misery in a bad station, destination in a low realm, low world in hell and what is the cause and condition why some beings here on the break of the, of the body after death are born in a good destination even in a heavenly world so that's a normal very normal Brahmin question. Brahmins were always aiming, you know, into the high realms, and they were, you know, like what 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 could take us there? And you know, they were worried about the hell and heaven, and for them it was just almost the ultimate. For us, we're trying to aim out of here. Don't try to aim anywhere. The Buddha. I'll give you a simile. The Buddha said, even if you get born as a non-returner. You know, you, non-return is the one way you, you, you are almost enlightened. Almost. You don't come back ever again as a human. You are going to the Devaloka, in a very high Devaloka. And you, from there, you, you, know, you practice there a long time. And it's a beautiful place to practice. Oh, everything is so good. And from there, you just you know, disappear. You don't get born anywhere else anymore. And as a deva anyways, you don't get born there, you just appear. Devas don't get born, devas don't get born as a baby and get a teenager and grow up. Devas just appear and you have a full body, nice set of clothes. And y you know, you're in the deva loka. So as a non-returner, that's where you are. And what, what, what did the Buddha say about that? Oh, aim there. Did he say that? No. The Buddha said, even that is like a little piece of shit underneath your nail. You can always smell it. Even that little bit, you know, get born there, it still has a little bit of shit underneath your nail. Don't aim there. Even that's, it's not the good place to get born. As a non-returner. What about rest of us? We have everywhere, all of our nails up it too. <laughs> okay. So, the pleasant one said, you know, um, so what, could Master go to myself about like why do some people go to good place and some people not so good place? And householder, listen, attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir. 
they replied there. Um, householders, there are three kinds of unrighteous bodily conduct. Conduct, conduct, con, conduct not accordance with the Dhamma. There are four kinds of unrighteous verbal conduct. Conduct not accordance with the Dhamma. There are three kinds of unrighteous mental conduct. Conduct not accordance with the Dhamma. And the Dhamma meaning how you should behave. That's uh, what you can uh, translate it here. Okay, so what are three kinds of unrighteous bodily conduct? So what do you do with your body? You kill living beings. He's murderous, bloody-handed, given to blows and violence. Merciless to living beings. He's an office maniac. He, he, well, everybody, yesterday uh, we were conducting a retreat and I was teaching loving kindness and it was like, seriously, everybody kept asking about, oh, it's all good and that, but you know, I have so, such a difficult people in office. So obviously these people, you know, like, and that seems to be the question and everybody asking yesterday, but so these people who are the, you know, the office Nazis are not uh, conducting themselves with the Dhamma. They're bloody handed, maybe not bloody handed. They're given to blows and violence, merciless to living beings. What's another uh, unrighteous bodily conduct? He takes what is not given. He takes by death, by the way of death, the wealth and property of others in the village or forest. Another one, he commits sexual misconduct. So these are the five precepts. The, uh, oh, actually it's not, oh yeah, the next ones are coming. So, and that is how there, there are three kinds of unrighteous bodily conduct, not conduct with accordance with the Dhamma. So you you are uh, you're merciless. You just you know you do actually physical acts of violence, sexual misconduct, and hang on, what was the word? Oh, the, of course, stealing. Yeah. And householders, uh, what are the unrighteous verbal conduct? The four kinds, not, which are not according to Dhamma. He speaks falsehoods. And then the Buddha talks about if you go to the court and relatives' presence, how you should be, you know, saying that it's like, oh, if somebody says, did you see that? Well, you should tell, you know, what you saw instead of so tell you what you know, not knowing, he says, I know, or knowing, he says, I do not know, not seeing, he says, I see, or seeing, he says, I do not say. So you speak, you try and don't try to, you know, speaks falsely, don't try to change, you know, the what you heard into other things, that's wrong speech. He speaks maliciously. He repeats elsewhere what he has heard in here in order to divide those people from these, or he repeats to, the, to these, to these, those people, what he has heard elsewhere or in order to divide those people from those. Thus he is one who divides those who are united, a creati creator of divisions who enjoys discord, rejoices in discord, delights in discord, speaks of words that create discord. That is really important ones and for us monks as well, we should, we have to be really careful as a monk, we, we, we don't try, we have to keep the sasana harmonious and that's why we, every time we do a meeting as the Buddhist monks, we can talk about it and afterwards you cannot bring the issue anymore. And it's it would be nice if everybody would behave that way, but unfortunately it doesn't work that way. So, he speaks harshly. He utters such words are rough, hard, hurtful to others, offensive to others, bordering on anger, not conducive to concentration. He engages in idle chatter. He speaks in the wrong time, speaks what is not fact, speaks that is what is useless speaks contrary to the Dhamma and the discipline. At the wrong time he speaks, such words are worthless, unreasonable, immoderate, unbeneficial. These are the four kinds of unrighteous verbal conduct. And householder, what are the three kinds of unrighteous mental conduct? Contal conduct not in accordance with the Dhamma. Here someone is covetous. He covets the wealth and property of others does. 
or may what belongs to another be mine or he has a mind of ill will and intentions of hate may these beings be slain and slaughtered may they be cut and perish or annihilated or he has wrong views distorted vision thus there's nothing given nothing offered nothing sacrificed no fruit or or result of good and bad actions karma no this world no others no mother no father no beings who are are reborn spontaneous no good no good and virtuous ascetics and brahmins in the world who have themselves realized by direct knowledge and declare this world another world that is how there are three kinds of unrighteous mental conduct conduct not in accordance dhamma so obviously in buddhism we always say and in the suttas we always have the negative so there's always the positive so the positive which is according to the dhamma obviously so you abstain for this okay so with that bodily behavior you abstain from uh, from the destruction of life you are merciful you dwell compassionate to all living beings you abandon what is not given abstains from taking what is not given he does not take the uh, wealth of others he abandons the sexual misconducts misconduct and the verbal conducts you abstain from false speech abandon malicious speech he does not repeat elsewhere what repeat elsewhere what he has heard he, here in order to divide those people from these nor does he repeat to those people what he have heard, heard elsewhere in order to divide these people from those thus he is one who reuni reunites those who are divided promoter of friendship he enjoys conquered he rejoices in conquered delights in conquered speaks words that promote conquered abandoning harsh speech he abstains from harsh speaks he speaks such words that are gentle pleasing to the ear and lovable lovable as go to the heart are courteous desirable many and agreeable to many abandoning idle chatter he abstains from idle chatters he speaks at the right time speaks what is fact speaks what is good speaks on the dhamma and discipline at the right time he speaks such words are worth a recording oh no reasonable moderate and beneficial that is how there are four kinds of righteous verbal conduct content accordance with the dhamma and the mental conduct so even your mental conduct you have good mental conduct and not so not so good mental conduct which produce karma even your mind produce karma yes some is covetous uh, is not covetous so this is producing good karma he does not you know want other people's wealth and property his mind is without ill will and he has intention free from hate thus may these beings be free from enmity affliction and anxiety may they live happily metta and there's also he has also right view there is what is given and what is offered what is sacrificed there is fruit and and result of good and bad actions there is this world and other worlds there is mother and father there are beings who are born spontaneous a good virgin ascetics and brahmins uh there are good and virtuous as brahmins of words themselves who are realized by the direct knowledge and declare this world and other other worlds so that would be the the uh the buddhas and the and the, and the uh enlightened ones the awok awoken ones that is how there are three kinds of righteous mental conduct conduct accordance with the dhamma so householder Householders, it is by reason of such righteous conduct, such conduct in accordance with the Dhamma, that some beings here on the breakup of the body after death are reborn in good destination, even in heavenly world. So, your karma is even your mind state, how you behave. So, if you do something. trying to hurt something out of ill will 
That's bad karma. You are stabbing somebody. Obviously, because you want their money. That's really, really, really bad karma. It's going to leave this imprint in your mind. But if you're stabbing somebody because you're a doctor with your scalpel and you're trying to care about the patient, you're taking out the kidney stones, whatever it is, and even then there's a, you know, hospital bacteria and this, you know, poor patient dies. Did you create bad karma by killing that person? No. Because you were acting out of caring, not out of hatred. You see how the karma works? So there is karma. There is results of karma. You do create karma. Everything you willfully make action, even when your mind, you are creating karma. Every action is karma. But most things are not caused by your karma. See how it's quite difficult? Do you get ill from your karma? Did you will to be ill? <laughs> will to be ill, that's funny. Did, can you say that, oh, I may not, but may, may I not be ill? No, because that's nature. That's not your mind. You didn't make up that in your mind. There's nobody there. If you could say, oh, I may, be, may I be happy today? It doesn't work that way. Even your mind doesn't belong to you, right? I wish I could be, I'm, every time you feel that kind of blueness, that kind of depression, anxiety, stress coming, oh, how nice it would be, it's like, oh, I'm just going to stop it here. That's it, okay, good, I'm just going to be happy today. We wish it could work that way, it doesn't. We're humans, we have feelings, but that's nothing to do with your karma. Although, then you can say, if you want to uplift your mind, well, do something good. Go and listen to Dhamma talk. Go and serve met the monks and nuns if they uplift your mind. Or even a soup kitchen somewhere. Try to do something good. Stroke your pet. Be kind towards yourself. All those things. Now you are creating good karma. Because you are actually doing good physical things. You're doing good physical, you're doing good right verbal actions and also right mental actions. You are acting out of kindness. So you see the suffering arising, anxiety coming. Ah, <gasps> Be kind towards it. Oh, it's so nice to be anxious again. <laughs> then you're creating good karma. If you try to get angry about the, you know, the anxiety, you're creating more bad karma and the, the, and the the anxiety gets worse. Very good. Any questions? Yes. Topics on calm always generate a lot of questions. Oh, okay, good, great. Uh, a question um, relates to Ajahn Achello, who did a talk here once, and uh, his father was a commercial fisherman. Ah, oh, yeah. So when he passed away, he said his father has a lot of karma to repay, something along the lines of that. But I've often thought about that in line with what you taught today. Mm. And uh, the intention of his father was to, I don't know his father, but I, I'm Yeah, just, you would have assumed that feed the family, this, yeah. you know, give the money in the table. His intention was to earn, earn a money. living, mm. to feed the world, mm. feed, feed people. Maybe not the world, but... Um, <laughs> but Maybe not the world, yeah. Yeah. but, but um, to, feed, to feed people. Yeah. And, uh, but perhaps he wasn't there when he was, when he was fishing uh, as a commercial fisherman to yeah. intentionally bludgeon these fish. And there was no intention of causing harm yeah. to them. Yeah. So what would you say around that? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. I mean, obviously the Buddha said you should, you know, like in that sutra, you know, you should... Uh, he's a bloody handed, he, you know, he works in the slaughterhouses and kills animals and there's, there's, um, we should avoid certain things like, you know, serving poisons, you know, and that would be, you know, you work in a bar, you know, in a and those kind of things, you, you try not to deal weapons, you try not to, you know, try to be away from certain jobs like, you know, being a slaughterhouse 
person who kills the animals. The fish, again, yeah, I could see that that's, it, it does, I w it, it would create, you know, but come uh, The thing is, as a fisherman, obviously he didn't go into trap because he wanted to be unkind to the, you know, the fish. He, he just grew up in an environment where there was maybe in the seaside and there was an obvious work to take on and he could see, you know, it's maybe his father was a fisherman, who knows, and he just sort of, it wasn't his karma to get in there and nobody ever told him anything that is bad. How can anybody in a fishing village say, you know, fishing is bad? It's just our livelihood. That's how we bring the money in, you know, like you said, the food in the table. And he wasn't intentionally torturing the, the fishes. So, how much bad karma he did that? Great. Let me tell this this way. I come from really rural background, so um, there's a lot of big forest around where I come from, and hunting is the thing. And my my grandfather was almost a professional hunter. They just said he was just almost hunting for the whole village. And it's just the thing where men go into hunting. And there used to be a lot of game where I was in the generation before, like my father tells and, you know, all the people who are in the village that there used to be so much game, a lot of birds, moose, hair, all kind of things, where they used to go shooting all the time and you could just, you know, get it all the time. But a lot of these older men now, because it's so rare to see these big birds which we hunt, that they stop doing it because they feel it's too precious. They don't feel good about it. A lot of old men who've been hunting for a long time even the moose, which they are still excesses, you know, they and they cause a lot of damage, not just for the forest, but you also get a lot of accidents, car accidents. Moose are really dangerous when you hit, they're massive animals. They have really long legs and they, when you hit them, they come into the wind, windscreen and kills actually people. A lot of them, they say they cannot really do it anymore. They don't feel comfortable about it. There is something inside of these, even these, they've been hunting since they were kids. They were taught by the fathers and they've been hunting. They don't feel comfortable looking at that animal and shooting it. Because it's this consciousness there. Um, and I know the feeling myself. I shot one bird. One bird. That was enough. For me, it was a weird feeling because you, 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 this excitement of hunting. Fishing is maybe different, especially in a commercial, because you're just pulling the nets. But, but I remember when I was, you know, like, and I just came out of military, and in the military you carry the weapon everywhere, you keep shooting, and so you, you, you create this kind of habit when you're with the guns all the time. So you have this habit. So I had this habit coming when I came of military, and my father had the, all the hunting gear there, so I was just like starting shooting. I was shooting target, and then one time I saw this bird, and these birds are annoying birds, they have not a beautiful voice and they eat all the berries from the, and it's like, so nobody really likes those birds, unfortunately. So I saw this little one and he wasn't ready to fly yet, but it, the, it's the size of an adult, but the, the feathers weren't ready yet, so he couldn't fly. So I was just hopping there, you know, just eating the, the worms. And I was like, oh, this is exciting. So I was just looking behind the house and seeing, I was like, oh, there he goes. So it's gonna be the last blow for that one. And I take the rifle and I was just aiming, and it's so exciting. I hope that, you know, the bird is not gonna, you know, just run off, and then you're never gonna cut it, and you, you, and you shoot it. And as soon as I shot it, there's this empty feeling. The excitement just stopped. And I saw the, the bird just like hopped, and then, you know, it lands on the ground, and it wasn't moving. And I was just hoping that maybe it's just acting. <laughs> I hope I didn't kill it. Maybe, maybe it's just playing up and it just like wants me to walk away and then it's going to start walking again. And I go and it's like, oh, it's dead. And it was really an empty feeling. The excitement is not there anymore. There is excitement in hunting and even fishing, you know, like you try to catch the fish when you're doing, you know, just, just a little bit of fishing, just, you know, throwing the line and all that. And there's excitement, but when you, after you caught the fish, there's the is, is there really excitement anymore? And killing the fish, all that, it just doesn't create really good feeling. Commercial fishing, yeah, I mean, you, 
again, you know, there is that aspect, but it's difficult to say. It's a lot, a lot of things we do. The Buddha said, you know, kamma is like there's black kamma and there's white kamma. If you, the only ones who create really just white kamma, who are those people? They're the Aryans. They are the fully awakened ones, awakened ones. They can create, you know, only white kamma. They don't really attach to that anymore. But they cannot create anything bad anymore. They cannot, you know, say anything wrong anymore. They can only speak out of kindness. They cannot have bad mental conducts because if their mind is pure. Everything they do, even if they accidentally bump into you, they do it just accidentally. It's not, they don't create bad karma. They would not go fishing. That would, that wouldn't be white karma. But there's, you know, black karma. And black karma, you know, black karma would be the one where you are actually doing something out of spite, ill will, greed. You are fishing as much as you can, even though you know you don't need any more, but you just, you know, you're greedy and you just, you know, you're depleting the fish on this stock, but you just take everything you can just so you can buy a new Mercedes. That might be quite quite dark and you're greedy. But most of the stuff is mixed. It's this kind of great stuff, right? You're fishing because you feed your family, so you, you, you provide them and you know, you're hoping your children will do well and you educate them and all that. But at the same time you you know, this is your livelihood. You so you're creating these dark things. And most of the stuff we do we're di trying to do good, we're trying to act out of kindness, but there is this kind of holding into it. Oh, I'm helping somebody, but I wish they would respond back to me. It's, there is, you at, you're attached to that. As long as there is a sense of self, we always create, you know, mixes. The karma is there. Very good. There's a question. The can you wait for a microphone so everybody can hear? Sorry, yeah. Thank you. Mm. Uh, this is more of a comment and a question mixed together. The Buddha said that life is dear to all. Yeah. He was also noted for his great compassion. Yeah. So if one knows that life is dear to all, if one has compassion, how can anyone intentionally take a life, whether it be for commercial fishing or mm. hunting or anything else? Because you are born in a situation where they, that's just a norm and you don't think anything of it. I, I, I don't think, I mean... Isn't that ignorance though? Yeah. Uh, well, is it ignorance? Yeah, sure, that's ignorance. Well, I mean, it's just... Let's say my grandfather, who was a, almost like they said, I, I never met him, he died young. Whether it was his karma or not, I don't think so. But he was a, almost like a professional hunter. But he was really hunting for, that, um, for the family, to feed the family. And there were tough times, you know, in olden days. You had to hunt. Ancestors here, our ancestors in Europe, they had to hunt. Did they create ka bad karma? Did the, you know, who dwelled here and, uh, and they knocked the kangaroos? Were they, well, are they creating bad karma? The way they creating bad karma? I'm not sure. Maybe the standards weren't so high. Maybe we are getting a bit more conscious about killing things. There's more and more interest into being a vegetarian. You know, n not eating meat which is cruelly produced, that there is all the time this kind of interest that, you know, like, is this, is this meat being produced by cruel means? So Maybe there is, sorry, yeah. So can I ask a question then? If you had to choose between taking the life of an animal to keep yourself alive, or starving and possibly dying, what would the choice be? What would be the decision? It, the, yeah, the, the thing is like, it's, it's I, I can see the question, but whether it's valid or not, is it going to come? 
is you know are you gonna end up in a bush and there's a kangaroo and you need to shoot no, might be I would say a better question would be let's say you hit a kangaroo and it's not dead would you club it to death or leave it lying there which is more merciful it depends what your intention is is it to put the animal out of its misery or is it to feed yourself because you're starving, for example? Well, I'm, most likely we're not going to starve. I mean, it's yeah. a more hypothetical. But the Buddha said we should, ne we should not kill animals. Or even, you know, like an, obviously going to the... So where's the limit then? I mean, as a monk especially, I'm not supposed to. I'm, I'm really one of quite a, you know, like I have a lot of precepts. And killing is, is one of those, you know, high up there. And I shouldn't be... It's it's a difficult, especially for us monks. Like we had a cat in Porinyana, and he was a he had a cancer, nose cancer. It's just you know um, skin cancer because it's just it's one of those cats who just love to lay in the sun all the time. And so <laughs> I had this bald spot on its and then we take you know the cat's medical bills were higher than the whole monastery for two years. <laughs> we were taking so good care of that cat, you know. And his cat's name was Hammer Smash Face. And at the end, it definitely looked like a smash face. The whole, you know, the nose just rotted away. And none of us, we was like, what can we do? We can't really put down the, you know, the cat. And then at the end, I remember I came one morning and uh, we were washing our balls after the Pindabad. And uh, I said, Hammer was really in Uganda. I said, Hammer, do you want to die? And he just goes like this. And I said, did everybody see that? I said, Hammer, do you want to die? And he just goes like this. And I said, ah, oh, it's time to take Hammer to the vet. And we took the Hammer to the vet, and the vet was really angry at us. He said, you are making that animal suffer. They would have put down the you know, Hammer for months ago. You know, by this time, the milk was coming out of his nose. It was really disgusting, you know. It was cause, but we were really, really tight and trying to take good care of it. We, couldn't, we didn't feel that we, it was time to go, but this time... Everybody saw that I think it's time for Hammer to go. I think it was a merciful thing to do. So even for us monks, sometimes I remember there was a, you know, sometimes we go into the teach in the prison and, uh, and it, we come out night time and we hit the kangaroos only once, I remember now. But what can you do? Maybe it is more merciful to put put the, you know, the animal out of the misery, even though it's not really... Am I creating bad karma? Sometimes you just have to take it. Or termites, you have to, you know, the, some of the kutis in Porinyana, termites were eating. What can we do? We try to do our best. We removed all the wood, try to do our best. The termites were just making nests and eating the books, getting into your, you know, bedding, eating everything. So we just have to get there. We made a Sangha decision that we're going to get a termite, termite ex, uh, the, somebody to remove the termites. There's, w there's nothing that we could do about it. We created bad karma as a, as a sangha, as a whole. Yes, we did. Those termites were, you know, they were killed because of us. But sometimes you just have to take it. It's almost like that. Thank you. No worries. Um. I just, this is more of a comment really too because I will remember as a kid i um, got a lot of memories of people killing animals and so on because times were very tough and uh, for our family um, people would go out and kill rabbits yeah. so it's literally to put food on the table yeah. so they're very interesting issues and also the killing of, um, of rabbits to feed the dogs that were you know an integral part of farm life uh, those things just had to go on yeah. if you were going to even keep dogs. So, I mean, it, it's it's just such difficult decision-making, yeah. really. Um, so I was just supporting what yeah. you were saying. Yeah, yeah. And uh, with the with the karma as well, with the one thing you have to remember with the karma, you, you, we think, you know, we obviously try to create as much as good karma we, you know, possibly can. Try to be kind, act out of kindness, do good things. And the Buddha said, but even that is... You know, it's a stick, and the stick always has two ends. And that's like the simile for your kamma. When you take the stick and you throw it up in the air, which end is going to come down first? 
hopefully it's going to be the heavy end. The goodness. You're going to get born in a good family. You get born in a you know, good destination instead of like a, a poverty, war-thorn country, somewhere like this. You get born into family which takes care of it, take care of you, and you feel like you're worthy of something you are. You don't have depression, ill will, those things. But the stick always have the light end, right? When you throw it up in the air, which end is going to come down? You don't know. Most likely will be the heavy end. And hopefully the heavy end is the goodness, kindness, generosity, all those things what the Buddha just, you know, what I was just reading. But he might also land on the other end. That's why we have Nibbana. Otherwise there's no point of striving. Oh, I always do good and I always be, everything goes well forever and ever. We just get smarter and smarter and better and better. Ah, it doesn't work that way. There's always the light end. It might just land on the light end next time. Da, da, da. I have to be careful. Try to get out of here. One day when does um, your will or intention is taken over by uh, or influenced by cause and effect and influenced by karmic forces? So isn't it all uh, sort of interwoven? Because for instance, a person who is doing a lot of good um, karmically was possibly born to a, a good family where there was, you know, uh, the um, conditions to do good because someone who is suffering and is from, you know, really poor background is, is struggling and unable to do the things that this other person who has been born to a um, good, generous sort of atmosphere and good parents. So isn't it all interwoven together? I mean, it's very difficult to say this is intention and this is karma and this is danger and cause and effect. Can you comment on that, please? Um, yeah, um, sure. First of all, karma doesn't belong to you. It's not your karma. Otherwise, you could just sort of use your karma. Oh, I, now I created a lot of good karma. I got born there, heavenly realm. Maybe you. It's just cause and conditions in that sense that it just sort of pushes you in a certain direction. There is nobody there to begin with. That's what you have to remember. Anatta, the Buddha said, if there's no self there, who does the karma belong to? It's not like a bank account. You can sort of go and tap into it. It doesn't belong to you. It's just, it takes you to a certain direction. Only thing you can do, let's say there's anatta. Well, how can we do anything really. The only thing Ajahn Brahm always says, the only thing you can do is sort of, you see that, you know, you get brainwashed by the, the, the Dhamma and you, you can just, you try to act according to the Dhamma. You see the danger in the, you know, in the wrong actions and you turn away, away from the, you know, wrong actions, from the, you know, which is not Kamma. And I think I forgot most of your question, but, uh, what, sorry, what, so, so what, I said was, uh, uh, what I said was really now it is my, somebody's intention to, to do so something. Yeah, so but at the same time, there is the conditions that influence that person, and at the same time, there is some karmic force behind it. So it's well, all interwoven. That's my question. Yeah, so, okay, well, then again, you know, everything is, let's say, it's cause and conditions. So obviously it is, there's nobody there, you are, you know, the conditions come to your mind from the outside and that makes you go to one direction. Is that your karma then? There is the karma is there because you are sort of willingly, that's your will, is like, okay, I'm go, gonna go into that direction. Everybody's, you know, they're advertising alcohol and everybody seems to be drinking. There's a, you know, this is the culture in Australia. I drink as well because I'm part of the culture. You are willingly going to that direction or you are turning away from that. The only thing you can really is to, you know, turn away from somewhere. And that's, in that way, you're creating wholesome karma. But you don't really... It doesn't, still doesn't belong to you. But yes, every action, every thought moment, if you act on it, is karma. Creates karma, rather. Every thought moment, every action you make, if it's with will, 
creates karma. So karma, you know, you, all the time you are creating karma, but it doesn't, you know, how much of that is going to influence you? It's a difficult topic, I don't know how to, but do you, do you realize it's every, those small little things, so it's not like these big things, I killed an elephant and um, get, get stumped by an elephant next time, lifetime. It's, but we also say I, I'm the owner of my karma, born of my karma, by dependent mm. on my karma. So any good or bad I do, surely I'm the owner of the karma. I mean, we, we say that, so, but mm. what you're saying is we don't own the karma. But we are actually chanting that. Yeah, d yeah, we are. You know, you are heir to your karma in that sense that it, it's this like, you can imagine it this way. It's like a big ship going in one direction. There is nobody really steering the ship because it's a big ship. You think you're steering it. You think you're in there like a, in a you know, tower and watching, oh yeah, I'm going to this direction. I'm going to the good direction. But you're not. You don't know. There's a lot of karma from your all those previous lifetimes. That's just like a big tanker. And it's sailing to one direction. You cannot turn it. And that's why there's an idea of Oh, I don't practice now, but then when I come to the last moment, I have this thought, I want to get born in a Devaloka. Doesn't work that way, because the ship is going to that direction. And you want to go that direction, but it doesn't work that way. If you are most of your life prone to violence and, you know, using, you know, abusing alcohol and relationships and all that, your ship will go to that direction. If you train, I've been so fortunate being, you know, coming across, you know, Dhamma and, you know, being trained by good monks that I'm changing my direction into loving kindness more and more, starting from myself, you know. I'm not a special person, but I just have to keep adding loving kindness towards myself, my actions and my mind and all that. And by that, my mind is steered towards, you know, more and more metta. And hopefully that will steer me again into the right direction, or even away from here. But whether I still get sick, you know, I still get born probably in the same family if I get born. But my mind is now conditioned with the, you know, metta, more and more. But the person who was born to this unfortunate circumstances, who is killing and who is stealing, all this kind of thing, surely that's his karma. I mean, something must happen for him to change that. I mean, maybe meet a monk or, you know, get the opportunity to go mm -hmm. to, to yeah, a yeah. place. So it, it's, it's all interwoven. That's what I'm trying to yeah. put to you, Panthi. Yeah, yeah. I understand what you're saying. Sure. But whether it's come or not, I don't know. That's the, the, yeah. I mean, I get so, f these days, like everybody says, oh, my, it's, oh, I'm sick, it's my karma. I just get <gasps> Okay, okay, stop. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay, sure, if you think so, that's fine. But, yeah, no, I understand. I'm not trying to put you down, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're overshooting it. That's not your comment, no. For pin yeah, it's time to stop, sure. I guess. <laughs> I guess it's time. We, we do have one online question. Okay, let's take the online question. I, I answer quickly. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's time for uh, Dana. Yeah. Okay, it's a little bit off topic, but um, I'm attached to my thinking that is so destructive at times. Do I need to physically detach from those I'm attached to so I can find peace? Yes, yes. Move to the mountains in Himalayas and live in the cave for the rest of your life and you never have problems with your thinking. It doesn't work that way. The thing you, you know, the best holiday is not from other people, from, from yourself. When you take a break from yourself, oh, it's so nice. When I take a break from Mudito, ah, oh, it's so good. My thinking is just like, ah, oh, I'm fed up with Mudito. I wake up with Mudito, I go to sleep with Mudito, I'm with the Mudito, giving talks with the Mudito, and other people make comments how Mudito acts, and that. <gasps> it's a lot of suffering. The only thing is to have kindness. Whatever it is, you cannot push it away. You cannot do anything about it. It will follow you. The only thing you can do, that's the only thing, but let's say the best thing is to do always at metta, compassion, acceptance, 
everything and we just keep at it on everything and it becomes less and less and less. And same with the you know meditation. We were doing meditation retreat yesterday. Just acceptance, santuti, contentment. Oh yes, I can see thinking coming, that's fine, nothing to do with me, just clouds coming in the sky. No, you, you, there's nothing you can do. You, you cannot change your dog barking or your mom giving instructions or your father telling you how to behave and husband, wives and co-workers and office workers. and That's life. Chip away. Meta. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.